Right, Jeff Wilkinson. Uh, Virgin. Whatever. First time. Thanks. Don't we make them get up and tell her something about each other when they're right now? Oh, yeah, but that'd be a lot. Of good. <laughs> hey, it's good for you to, to uh, just get off of that. <laughs> okay, so let's get started. Um, my name is Chris. This is Startup Meetup, our weekly event to promote innovators from the region, and that includes Dave Mann. Let's give him a round of applause. He's a little self facing but. But make no mistake, this is an innovator right here. And to I paid you to say that. What's that? I paid you to say that. Yeah. <laughs> but to confirm that he's self-facing, the accidental startup is the name of his presentation. So um, it's a great story. Dave was a, a coworker here, and he's a um, de facto, if not publicly acknowledged SharePoint expert, maybe in the universe. Released in the solar system. Something. In my own mind, maybe? No. Now you, uh, well, we'll let you do a little bio when we get started. Okay, actually, yeah, it's part of my, part of one of the stories I'm going to tell. Okay. So, it's a little bit about me. Uh, last week was the first week I may have missed ever. I don't know if I ever missed a start meetup. Yeah. But. This anti hero shirt. Fire. Oh. Hero. Yeah, <laughs> praise the fairmans. I may look cooler than uh, I really am. <laughs> I do skateboard, but I don't know anti-hero skateboards. Um, so last week, on Tuesday, we were, I was, we were, I can use the we, at Philly Forum, which is a pretty big uh, technology conference at Penn. And we were there to represent Mongoose, our uh, startup. but. After I gave out Mongoose's cards, I gave out one of the Sheet Labs cards, and uh, it was cool that a lot of people knew about us in Philly. Since I have too many kids to handle, I don't really travel outside of the borough ever. Uh, ben does, and when he does... I also rag on you for never leaving. Yeah. So I was really proud of you for leaving. You feel good? Yeah. Well, my daughter, my youngest daughter, just celebrated her first birthday, and she's sleeping three hours in a row. <laughs> So I suspect I'll venture to Newtown Square by next year, be in Philly more than once a year. But it was really good to, to know that people hear about the Mongoose Lab brand, you know, with a little uh, train that could out Westchester. And Ben does a phenomenal job of getting that us known in those areas. And you were just at the kickoff of Tech Week. <coughs> yeah, I got to do the startup call, which is cool because we've had a lot of people from Philadelphia come out here. And I got a chance to transplant <coughs> myself into Philadelphia and see their spaces. So that was cool. Cool. And you came back with some um, startup meetup meet speakers? Oh, yeah. Um, right now we're booked into September. And wow. um, after Philly Tech Week, we'll probably be booked into next September. <coughs> wow. Because that means we have to be open. Yeah. Yeah, that, I was actually <laughs> um, uh, feeling that same stream of consciousness. Like, wow, uh, maybe we should. That gives us a little bit. To not <laughs> So we were at uh, Philly Forum, and Mongoose has made it uh, into the final round. We we're in the demo pit, which sounds like crap, but it's, uh, <laughs> it was right around all the food, so it was good. Everyone came with us, uh, and we got to go on stage with uh, Peter Coffey from Salesforce and give one more pitch, and we lost to a factoring company, um, which I can make a protest officially I would, because uh, the spirit of the whole entire conference was breaking down silos, data across the enterprise, and all this was questions in there. If anybody wants to talk big data with me, uh, let's talk after Dave Mann shares the story. Uh, let's see, who's next week? We've got Paul Keoghan, who is the founder uh, of Back Office Thinking. Consultancy for nonprofits, a technology consultancy, happens to be right down the street. Uh, they're redoing Longwood Gardens website, and he's done a couple of startups, so uh, he should be a good local person to know. Night owls tomorrow, Ben. Are we? Um, we doing are anything? beginning our first installment of the prototyping competition. Oh yeah. Uh, in addition to that, yeah, that's a big deal. Um, we had. Had the kickoff, we allowed to have it here, um, but it was really great. And 
Um, so this tomorrow will be the first prototyping actual competition part. And we're going to be hosting a variety of boot camps um, associated with the kind of background information necessary to create a wireframe that we're going to create. And then forget photo conferencing. The new hashtag should be almost illegal. Because <laughs> uh, cool. that's been our goal to kind of fit more people than legally allowed. We had about 100 people with the videos online. So if you're dying to, to get in, we could probably work in through back channels and get you uh, assigned to a team. But we have 17 teams. Uh, we, we were sweating it. We thought, maybe we get four. Uh, so there's 17. I think there's a 13-year-old guy and maybe a 65-year-old person, like and everyone in between. So I don't know if Unisys knows what they signed up for, but uh, they, they're good sports so far. Um, and we double booked, uh, so not this week, but two weeks next, from uh, next tomorrow. Week. Two weeks. I think it's April 29th. Yeah, that's not this week, but next week. We have a really uh, awesome Philly <coughs> author named Andrew Irvin, who wrote Burning Down George Orwell's House. Uh, he's a national author, and he should fill this place on his own. He had the Dead Milkmen open for him in Philly. So any author that can get the Dead Milkmen to... Are they still around? I don't think it was a YouTube video. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> a hologram, maybe it fell. <laughs> Um, but we're going to have to find a way to get the prototyping competition and in the same space. Yeah, that's going to be fun. Yeah. All right. Um, thank you to the I2N, CCEDC. Um, actually, let's talk really quickly about the ITAG conference, which is Friday. It is run by the information. What does ITAG stand for? Innovative Technology Action Group. So that's a regional uh, consortium of technology companies and economic development oriented organizations. Last year was our first year there, and it was cool. There was about 150 people. Some good conferences. It's a one day conference at Penn State Great Valley. And this year uh, we are presenting on big data. And Andrew Schwab, our senior advisor here at the lab, is talking on mobile security or security. In General. We um, tickets are for sale. It's a great networking opportunity to meet lots of local companies, and there will be some demos at the end of the day. Sid, are there additional details that I should surface right now? You've done a great job. There will be a, an innovation showcase. There'll be six to eight companies that are going to give a three-minute, four-minute pitch, and then. Will be available in the lobby to answer any questions. So good food and good drink. So, awesome. the end of the day. Cool. And, yep, let's, uh, would you like to introduce Jim? Sure. Yeah, we actually have a visitor all the way from California today. Uh, this is Tim Rode. Here, if you want to come up and tell them about your festival you have coming up soon. Sure. Uh, my name is Tim Rode. I, I run a nonprofit called One Life Fully Live. And I put some flyers back there, and this is something that's right up all of your alley. It's a weekend to take a, a step outside your everyday life, and, and instead of working in your life, you're looking at where am I going with all this. Our, our motto of our nonprofit is everybody has a dream, few have a plan for their dream, and precious few are living your dreams. And what we do is we bring in these world class presenters from all over the country who fly in for nothing. And, it's, and uh, we have sessions everywhere, everything from uh, how to write a plan. There's a guy here, David Osborne. He gets over 100 paychecks a month coming in. These are world-class people, everything health, fitness, how to have it all. Uh, we feed, it's $89 for two days, $60 for a day, free breakfast, free lunch. We'll give away 1,000 books. No one's selling anything there. It's just a total labor of love. And uh, we, we've done four of these out west. Really good to bring people you want to bring up with you. Your kids, your niece, your mastermind group. It's just a really awesome thing. As I said, no one's selling anything. And I'm all <coughs> oh, we also have scholarships. Uh, and you go to onelifefullylive.org. If you have anybody that can't afford to come, 
just that haven't fill out a scholarship thing and uh, we have very generous people like my friend Mike McCarthy donates two thousand dollars so we can put this on and, and have it and fill it up and rock the house so anyway thanks for your time hope to see a lot of you there all right thanks we'll be sharing some content for our social channels yeah, yeah. so everyone can kind of get a plan for that uh, last thing on uh, the Unisys prototyping competition, they're, we're in a partnership. The event is the first thing that's coming from the project. Uh, but we added two sponsors, uh, the I2N has signed up to be a sponsor of that, uh, and Envision App, which is a uh, prototyping tool. And we're having the deliverable come through that. And I just, on a whim, asked the uh, CEO through LinkedIn if they would uh, sponsor us. And he said yes. They're going to do a story about us, which raised the profile of everything that's going on because they're a national company. It's a tool that Twitter, Netflix, every big design or consumer internet company probably uses. It's awesome. So thanks to the sponsors, including Fox, uh, Fox Rothschild, Brennan, Brennan Office, Interiors, The Hanging Group, Niter TV, that aka Sean Kaminsky over there live streaming. And thank you to Jared for taking such awesome photos, and Mike for running second camera out there, actually third camera. He's got two cat and an iPhone. So let me turn it over to Dave. Uh, like I said, Dave was a coworker. I've known Dave for a while, and this is a really compelling story, so I'm looking forward to hearing the details. Thanks for coming. First, how many people remember the dead milk event? A little more than I thought. It's actually pretty interesting. Okay. Um, good old Rodney Anonymous. Um, okay, so as Chris said, my name is David Mann. Uh, I was a co worker here in the past. Um, I had to stop basically because uh, it came down to the point where I, I just couldn't fit 40 minutes to commute in here uh, into my schedule. Things just got crazy, crazy busy. So uh, after this is all over, I'm going to be talking to Chris again and seeing about uh, coming back in because I think it was really, it was very interesting. I think it was very good for me at the time um, and things are hopefully, knock on, knock on wood, starting to get to the point where I can almost fit in 40 minutes worth of time just to get my butt down here. <clears throat> so uh, I have a couple of stories to tell. Uh, I tend to, make, to kind of make my presentations about telling stories. Uh, as opposed to just standing up here and blathering on about things that may or may not be related. Um, so hopefully the, the stories will be a little bit interesting. Uh, I will say up front that, front that since uh, Chris and Ben and I talked about me doing this uh, startup meetup, uh, things have changed. Uh, if, there's, if there's one thing that uh, I've learned about the startup community, the startup world, is that just when you think things are pretty much locked in place and you, and you know how things are going to go, something comes out of left field and throws you a curveball. So that's one of the stories that I want to tell is what some of those curveballs were, uh, how they came into play, and how I dealt with them. Right. So let's see if this is going to work. Okay, so before I get started, um, and this is going to come up around uh, a couple times as we go through my stories, how many people here are actively involved in a startup? Okay, so now the next question, why? Startups are hard. Does anybody think startups are easy? Okay, startups are hard. So a couple of people, I'm gonna put a couple of people on the spot. Why are you doing this? And this actually ties in very clearly, I'm, I'm sorry, I forget your name, but very, Tim, very closely to what Tim was saying. Um, we'll see when I get into a couple more slides, but Andrew, why are you doing startup? I'm passionate about solving problems that actually make a difference. Okay. Very good. Uh, who else? One or two Excitement, more people. Energy. Excitement, energy. Okay. Who else? It's fulfilling to have your own idea come into the real world. Okay. All right. Um, those all seem to be, well, two of them seem to be related to kind of the feeling that you get, um, the, the excitement of working in a startup. And there's no doubt that startups are exciting. Okay. Uh, Andrew likes to solve problems. He wants to see that come into fruition. I think that kind of dovetails into these two fairly nicely uh, when you actually s can solve a problem. Okay. A lot of times in startups, you, you spend a lot of time beating your head against a wall and maybe never actually get to the point where you solved a problem. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I have a slightly different take on it. And, and 
this dovetails into what Tim was talking about. All right, so if my, forgive me, I forgot my clicker, so I'm trying to use my mouse here. Um, I have a slightly different take on why I'm involved in startups. Okay, I've been consulting in the computer industry since roughly 1996. Um, I'm 49, well, almost 49, a little old, quote unquote, to be starting in the startup world. Um, but my goal is actually because I want to stop trading dollars for hours. Okay, when you do computer consulting or really any type of consulting, every hour you work, you get paid a certain number of dollars. If you don't work any hours, you don't get any dollars. Okay? At this point in my life, uh, that is not something that is very appealing to me. It worked fine when I was younger and I could work 40, 50, 60, 70 hours a week, no big deal. Made a lot of really good money. But at this point, this is my family. Um, two kids in college. My youngest son here has special needs. He will, be, he will be with my wife and I for the rest of our lives. Okay, so it's not something where I'm looking at it and saying, you know, I've got my retirement, I'm gonna sit around the house. I, I'm gonna have responsibilities, you know, for at least his care for the rest, as long as I'm alive, okay? But that doesn't mean that I want to continue trading hours for dollars. In about two weeks, we're buying the beast. Okay, or we've bought the beast, we're picking up the beast. Um, one of the very nice things about my particular line of work is that it doesn't matter where I am when I do my work. I have one client that I work for part-time right now doing consulting. I've already checked with them before we purchased the beast and said, do you care where I am when I do my work? And he said, no, as long as I can get a hold of you, I don't care where you are, I don't care when you work. So in that sense, it was kind of a very uh, appealing thing for me to stay with that particular client. So I can be you know, sitting somewhere where I'm looking out at the Grand Canyon and doing work. We can go see Mount Rushmore in the afternoon and I can work in the evening. Whatever we choose to do, as long as I can get an internet connection, more often than not, I can do work. It's really hard to say I'm going to be able to do consulting work for anybody but my one very flexible client right now. So in that sense, something that's going to bring in recurring revenue is very appealing to me. I'm going to try to keep this close by so I don't get like Marco Rubio. Um, so I'm entering into a phase of my life that I'm calling semi-retirement. And basically what that means is that I'm more in charge of, of what I'm doing, or I want to be more in charge of what I'm doing than I have been in the past. If I choose to work at a certain point, I can work. I have a product, several products that I'm working on. I can work on them. I can work for my client. And I can make enough money to do what we need to do. We already have enough money put away for retirement. So I don't really need to worry about that too much right now. Let's see. OK, so I'm going to start with a little story about uh, how I began my startup journey. Uh, I had said I would tell you a little bit about my background. Um, and I'm not putting this up here to, uh, to brag, well, maybe just a little. Um, but just because this is going to come into play later when I talk about my startup. So as I said, I've been consulting since about 1996. Um, my degree is actually in English with a minor in philosophy, which means I came out of college totally unemployable. Um, my, but I could, I could talk, oh, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, I could talk about anything until I was blue in the face. So, and I could argue both sides of a point with myself if I needed to. Um, so my, my oldest son was born and I realized, you know what, I, I was working in retail at the time and I realized, you know what, I really don't want to be working in retail when the busiest time of year is Christmas, <laughs> not with kids. So got into computers, started working in the Microsoft field, um, jumped onto the SharePoint bandwagon. How many people are familiar with SharePoint? Okay, so jumped onto the SharePoint bandwagon uh, as luck would have it just at the right time, just at the point where it was going like this and then it went like that. Okay, and it just went into the stratosphere. Um, I've been an MVP in, uh, for Microsoft SharePoint since 2007. There's uh, 215 of us in the world. Okay, so I, I say this again, like I said, not to, to brag, but just to say that there, I, I have some credibility in this space. Okay, and that's gonna come around later when I talk about my product. Uh, I presented conferences, um, I've written for Microsoft, I do training, etc. So. That's the world that I play in, which is a little bit interesting in the startup world because you know, some people don't equate Microsoft technology and startup. Uh, the last session I did here, the last startup meetup I did, 
part of it was about how the Microsoft ecosystem is really very good for startups. There's a lot of benefits to being in that space. So my startup journey, this is a little bit hard to see, but how many people remember the Family Circus cartoon? Okay, so little Billy here is asked by his mom to go get some firewood, and this is basically the path he takes. Okay, and he goes all around, and he comes back to like two sticks. And that's basically been my startup journey. I run out the door, I no, I've got a direction I'm going in, I've got something I'm gonna do, and then something distracts me. And then I'm going that direction, and then something else distracts me. And then I get distracted again, I get distracted again. Uh, it could also be summed up, if I remember my slide order here, um, easily distracted by shiny objects, okay? Um, guilty as charged. I'm absolutely guilty of the shiny object syndrome, okay? So uh, I very much tend to move from one interesting thing to another. That's been my biggest problem in the startup space. Okay, so now we'll move on to the story of my accidental startup. Um, I needed to focus. I needed to get away from the shiny object syndrome. So with some credibility, with some history in the SharePoint and the Office 365 space, if you're not familiar with it, uh, Office 365 is Microsoft's uh, cloud offering for things like collaboration, document management, email, uh, communications, etc. cetera. Um, so I had some credibility in that space. So I was focusing on applications, consulting, services, uh, training, various things related to Office 365. I actually sat down and put together a three-year plan, something I'd never done before. Uh, and it, it, in, in terms of, of aggressiveness, sometimes it was probably over-aggressive, sometimes it was under-aggressive, which I think is probably about right. Um, the first step, I wanted to start building a marketing channel. So my marketing channel was going to be a newsletter. And I did this first because it was kind of the low-hanging fruit. I had an idea, I knew what was going to work in that space because there's a lot of information coming out about Office 365 and a lot of people in um, the Microsoft world, a lot of vendors are releasing products and services as add-ons to Office 365. So I wanted to be able to put some information out, kind of collect what was going on in the Office 365 world and release that. That's my newsletter, Office 365, weekly con Office 365 Concierge Weekly Newsletter just a summary of what's been going on in the Office 365 world that week, okay? So it was strictly a marketing channel. Once I got that going, and, and basically it was gonna be very, once I got it started, it was gonna be very hands-off for me. I hired a consultant through Odesk to um, collect the stories, to write the summaries, to categorize them, and to put them in a place where I could then review them, approve them, and publish the newsletter. So it was very low, uh, maintenance for me gave me time to move on to doing training videos for Pluralsight, to do a little bit of consulting work still for my client, but to start working on my products. Uh, so I talked about this already. So I had my contractor. Uh, I had a, uh, hired another consultant on Odesk to build a little newsletter generator that would take this information and actually generate the newsletter for me and publish it to. Uh, and then I could consume it from there to send out the newsletter. So as I said, very, very hands-off for me. I didn't, there wasn't a whole lot that I had to do once I got it up and moving. Um, now I'm in trouble. Okay, so this, this is when things started to go uh, kind of on a, on a tangent. Uh, the newsletter generator application that I designed and had someone build uh, for me piqued a little bit of interest. Chris and Ben thought it was cool. A couple other people I talked to thought it was pretty interesting. Uh, and somebody actually thought it was interesting enough to approach me and say, would you want to sell it? And I said, wow, there's, there's some interest here. There's something I could do. So um, I had a, a question, you know, what do I do? Do I take this and instead of selling it, do I turn around and make a product out of it and make a, a, a SaaS application? If just, you know, every single person that I talked to said this is interesting, might other people find it interesting enough to pay for it? Big problem with it though. It's completely outside my wheelhouse, okay? It had nothing to do with Office 365. I think in, in the next slide or the one after, I actually talked through the technology a little bit. 
um, but it had nothing to do with Office 365. I had zero credibility in the space that this particular application um, played. So what do I do? So that's when we come into this visual CMS thing. And this is the point where Chris and Ben said, oh, this is a great story. Let's talk about this. Let's have you in for a startup meetup and talk about what you're doing with this new product that I created, sold, and well, I'll get to that. Uh, so the application itself, the end result is HTML. It's generated uh, right now. It will generate just uh, straight HTML. It can also take that and publish it to uh, WordPress. So the information itself is stored on Trello cards. Is everybody familiar with Trello? Okay, so Trello gives you the ability to um, essentially have online index cards, for lack of a better term, and manage them visually. So you can drag and drop them from one list to another. So as it would move through the process of, I had an article that I wanted written, I would put it here, one of my contractors would pick it up, write the article, move it over to this next stage, I would review it, move it over to this next stage, the tool would pick it up and then publish it. So it gives you a visual way to manage content. So it worked with Trello cards and it would work with Google Docs. So it could pull information and generate HTML for output. Um, it had an, an independent HTML template so I could change the template however I needed to. And the output, as I said, was WordPress or HTML. Uh, the content would come from, and this is, this is part of the place where I felt this was really cheesy and I was surprised that anybody was interested in this. I set up a couple of Google alerts, some Bing alerts. Um, is, are people familiar with if this, then that? So I uh, so have that send me some, some information when things were uh, happening of interest. Somebody published a blog article or a press release related to Office 365 to certain keywords. I would get an email. I would take that email, I would forward it into my Trello board. Okay, it would show up on a, a list, or in, on a card. Um, I would have blogs that I read and I would have Twitter. So things that I was doing anyway, I was reading these blogs, I was you know, somewhat active on Twitter. This was the source of my content. All I was doing was getting it into Trello, having a contractor that I was paying nine bucks an hour to go through, sort through that information, collect it all, categorize it, put it in Trello, and then I would run my little application. So here's what it looks like in Trello. Each of these is a list, so you can see uh, I have a pending list in process when one of my contractors was working on it. When it's ready, it goes here. My application, which we'll see on the next slide, would pick it up from here and generate the newsletter and then move it over to published. So a pretty easy application, um, but like I said, it, it seemed to pique some interest. Uh, the app itself, uh, I just grabbed a screenshot of this. Some information about the, the Trello. Uh, it would go to a particular board. I could sort the labels here so I could say what order do I want these to be uh, arranged in inside the newsletter. It would sort them in this particular order. It would group all of the things by a particular category or label. And then it would publish it out to WordPress. So very, very easy application. To be honest, well, I, no, I won't go back. but. Um, <laughs> The application itself really was only ever a prototype. It was built as a Windows uh, Forms application, so it wasn't a web app, it wasn't online, it was just it's sitting on my desktop. <coughs> I, would, I would run it when I needed to, and it would do its thing, and it worked perfectly. Here's the newsletter letter that it generated. Altogether, it takes, you know, of my time, it takes maybe 20 minutes, and most of that is just proofreading stuff. Okay, so the output was HTML, uh, I would actually end up consuming it. I would put it onto my blog, and I would consume it from MailChimp. Just set up an RSS campaign in MailChimp. It would pull the, the most recent blog article from my blog in this particular category and send it out to my mailing list. Very easy, very hands-off. Um, but then I, then I had kind of the epiphany of, wait, what am I doing? This is not what I started out to do, okay? Remember what my goal was. The mailing list was just a marketing channel. I have zero credibility in the mailing list generation space online. Um, it was going to be a very long uphill battle for me to do anything with this. I'm not particularly good at marketing. 
It's not something that I enjoy doing. It's not something I'm, I'm you know, really any good at. So although technically, you know, it was a pretty good application, it worked, it did what it needed to do and there was some interest, for me to really take this and move it to the next step would have taken a lot of time that I just, I didn't have to build credibility in a space that was entirely new to me. So here comes the hard part. I actually had to stop, you know, talk to my wife, uh, I talked to you know, a couple people that I, that I have worked with in the past that I, that I trust, um, and I came to a very hard decision. Well, in some ways hard, in some ways not. Um, I sold the usage rights to it. Okay, so the company that I sold them to uh, generates or manages content in the Office 365 space. So it was, it was basically somebody that I knew was interested in this. Um, he approached me and said, you know, we'll give you some money. Not a lot. I'm not retiring on it. It's not paying for the beast. Um, it's not even paying to fill the tank in the beast. Um, but I am getting advertising income. Okay, so they're now going to, I'm going to be publishing my newsletter through their channel. Okay, so they're going to use my tool, I'm going to use my tool, but it, it allows me to step back and say it is still just a marketing channel. That's what it was intended to be to begin with, and while I, I kind of got a little sidetracked on it, I ended up coming back in where, hopefully, I'm going to say I made the right decision. Okay, and I'm, I'll show you some stats in just a moment. Um, so I get a little bit of advertising income because they sell advertising. Uh, they, they have a whole sales staff that does that, so I get some income that way. I get marketing reach, and I continue to keep my name out there. Okay, so here's where I start to talk about marketing reach. All right? When I started this, um, just the beginning of this year, the end of January, I had a whopping 23 subscribers. Woohoo! Uh, to be honest, I was really happy with 23 subscribers because I was thinking if I get 25 in the lifetime of this thing, I think I'm doing okay. So first month, I had 23 subscribers. Second month, hey, look at that. I had a little bit more than doubled my subscriber base. I was thrilled. I was ecstatic. Okay? So I'm up to 48 subscribers in February. I'm thinking I've about maxed out. No, nope, it kept going. We get to the end of March, and I doubled again. I'm thinking, wow, this is actually, I'm, I'm getting some attention out of this. There's some people that are interested in this. And uh, one thing that I didn't point out was one of the plans for this, kind of the, 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 the kind of super secret background plan, was I'm publishing a newsletter of things that are happening in the Office 365 space, new products that are coming out, new services that are coming out. And hey, guess what? If I can build my subscriber base, to the point where it's, it's got a good number of people in it, and then I build a product, well, guess what's gonna start showing up in the newsletter? Information about my product. It, I'm not gonna be, you know, it's not gonna be heavy handed, it's not gonna be right in your face, but every time I do something, it's gonna show up in the newsletter. And now I've got people who are interested in this space who are now seeing my information. So that's how this, that's one of the ways that this is a marketing channel. So we get to the end of March, and I've doubled again. I'm just shy of 100 people. And now it kicks in to the point where I'm now publishing it uh, for April. Uh, actually, the one, what time is it? Uh, in 25 minutes, it's going to go out to uh, the next, it goes out every Tuesday. Okay? And that's what happened to my subscriber base. A little over 7,400 people. Okay? And that's just by jumping on, you know, jumping into bed with this company that uh, has a, a lot of attention around what they're doing. So my marketing channel just went Phew, like that. This is what convinced me that I made the right decision. Okay, when I was about 100 people, I was thinking, yeah, you know, this is pretty good, but I now have a pretty good base. And, and this, I think, oh, um, by the way, actually, this is actually going to go out to, go out to more than that. There's about a, not, another 90 or so people that have signed on since I put the slide deck together yesterday. Okay, so um, this gives me a much broader audience to now market what I really truly am passionate about and what I want to do. Okay, so that number was pretty compelling. Uh, what do we have? So Visual CMS is dead, long live Office 365 concierge. So uh, I had a little prototype I built strictly for my internal use. There was some interest around it. I got all excited, followed the shiny object, got all set to start another you know, spin up yet another LLC. I think that would have been my fifth. 
um, and start a whole product. Unfortunately, I decided, hey, you know what, let's put on the brakes here. Let's think about whether this is really the right direction to go. So a couple slides back, I had the question, should I stay or should I go? Answer is I go. All right, so I sold the rights to it. Uh, I still have rights to it. So it's going to surface in some of my, or pieces of it are going to surface in some of my products. Um, but I went back to it being strictly a marketing channel. Okay, so we're getting ready to wrap up. The moral of the story, what is the moral of the story? Know when to pivot. <laughs> are, people, are people who are doing startups, you know, you familiar with the term pivot? Okay, pivot is basically when you look at it and say, this is the, the direction I'm headed in, and now I'm gonna go in this direction, or now I'm gonna go in this direction, okay? And knowing when to pivot is one of the harder things to do in the startup space, to me. The, the proper time to pivot is when you can honestly, objectively say uh, that your original course isn't valid. For any one of a number of reasons, the direction you thought you were going to be going in isn't the right direction anymore. The market changed, you changed, you, you tweaked the idea, whatever it may be, but you pivot. It doesn't mean you give up on what you were doing, it just means that you go in a different direction with it. Okay, Some, I guess sometimes it does mean that you give up and go in a wholly separate direction, but more often than not, you're gonna be better off saying, I thought I was going this way, I'm just gonna turn a little bit and go this way because here's something that I've learned that says to me, this is a better direction for where you wanna go, okay? Um, and the other thing is, it, it, for me, it has to be an undeniable opportunity. I looked at what I could have done with the uh, newsletter generator, with Visual CMS, is a, a name I made up when Ben pressured me to come up with a name for my pseudo product. Very aggressively. Yes, because um, you're such an aggressive person, Ben. <laughs> um, I looked at the opportunity that I had there. And I think I could have done something with it. I think I could have taken it and, and moved it forward and made some money, done okay with it. But I think I'm going to be better off in the long run using it as my marketing channel. So when not to pivot is when you're running in a certain direction and all of a sudden, ooh, squirrel. <laughs> That's not the right time to pivot. Okay, a pivot needs to be a thought out, methodical approach to I'm changing what I'm doing for these reasons. Okay, the shiny object, which I think a, a, a lot of the, the entrepreneurs that I've talked to, um, shiny objects are a problem. Um, so you need to learn to say, if I'm changing direction, there's a reason for it. Here are the, here's the business case, here's the reason that I'm saying I'm no longer going in this direction, I'm now going over here. So the other thing, again, remember the end game. Okay, for me, the end game is I don't want to work so damn hard. For me, the end game is I want to have a small stable of products that are each, I don't expect any of them to take over the world. I don't expect any of them to be my single source of income. But if I can get three or four small-ish products, you know, anything from a little newsletter generator to a WordPress plugin or two, uh, to a couple of little plugins for Office 365. If I can get a couple of those that each bring in, you know, an okay about amount of money, I'm good. I don't need to have the, the single product that I'm going to work on and sell and be all over, you know, Fortune magazine and, and everybody's, you know, the, I'm the new darling of the startup world. I don't care about that, okay? All of this is an end game, or is, is to get me to the end game of spending time with these people in the beast. Uh, what do we have? So here's what I've done. I've taken what was uh, originally part of a product idea and I'm wrapping a bunch of things into it. <coughs> Looking at the newsletter generator and making my decision about whether or not I follow that shiny object forced me to look at the different things that I had going on, the different shiny objects that I'd started to follow, and for one reason or another, moved off of. And it made me realize, in looking at those, that there was kind of a common thread across all of them. All of them could be wrapped into an umbrella product that I'm calling an, an intranet in a box. So you're a small to medium-sized business, and you want to be able to have a central place to put all of your information, 
But you know what, Office 365 is very good for that. All right, so here's some things that I'm going to release as a, you know, a family of products that will allow you to spin up your internet much more quickly. Okay? Um, so all of these things, including what was the newsletter generator, will be incorporated into that. Um, Ily and I in the corner over there, we have a mastermind group. We meet once a week and we talk, kind of talk through things. Um, and part of what we're going to be talking through this week is, you know, where does all of this fit? How do, I, how do I plan this? How do I roll this out in stages so I'm not, you know, nine months, nine to 12 months in producing something and then rolling it out and saying, oh, hey, guess what? I missed the ball. All right, so how do I break it down in individual pieces and work, the, work these pieces and then roll them out kind of progressively? Um, the other thing is diversification. This is kind of where I talked about I don't need to have the, the big app that everybody says, ooh, that's the most wonderful thing in the world. It makes me a million dollars a day, okay? Um, that's not my goal, all right? So I'm diversifying. I still do training videos. Um, I publish eBooks. I have little software packages. I'm producing software products. And I do public speaking and teaching. Uh, I still want to do consulting part-time because I, I do enjoy it. Just I don't want to be dependent upon it. It's also a good way to keep yourself kind of keyed in to what's going on in the world, all right? And then for some bizarre reason, we're also we're buying a house uh, to, to rent out. So a little bit of diversification. But one thing about this, all these things inside the box here, it's a build once, use many times. Okay? I'm building a software product. Well, part of it's going to end up, this, part of that is going to be inside a training video. I take the, the script for the training video, that's going to be my ebook. I take the demos that I built inside that training video, and I package them up in their software packages. So I'm doing things one, one and a half times and getting multiple uses out of them. And I think that's a good way to move forwards because if any one of these starts to slow down, I'm okay because I've got the others. So I don't need to have the big bang product. So that's my kind of repurpose, reuse, recycle. That's it. Uh, here's how to get a hold of me if you have questions. If you want to pay me a million dollars for my newsletter generator, I'll yank it back from that other company. I'll sell it to you in a heartbeat. Um, feel free to reach out. Um, but that's kind of my story. You know? And as I said, it changed because when I first talked to Chris and Ben about it, um, I think it, it might have been two days before that the, the company that ended up selling the usage rights to approached me and said, we want to buy it. And I was like, whoa, somebody, I did something good. Um, so, but things have changed, but it's okay. You know, I pivoted, I unpivoted, and I went back to the direction I was headed in. So, that's it. Any questions? Not bad for an English major. Not bad for an English major. Um, I, I just want to jump in before we turn it over to Q&A. And when you did uh, your startup meetup about this time, maybe last year. Yeah, about that. Uh, I remember you talking a little bit about this, and Michael Gutman, uh, advisor here, grilled you on the product company, product company. Right. And his thinking, if I recall, was traditional, like, well, you got to go the company route. Uh, but this is a great time because this is a product. You don't want to roll into a company. No. But someone out there has a pain point that this beautifully solves. So how do you find right. that? There's like thousands of opportunities like that. And yeah. I don't know if that necessarily Well, and that's, and, and that's where I think, you know, not looking for the, um, you know, I'm going to find the product that solves all the world's problems. You know, I'm going to find, here's this tiny little thing right here, this tiny little sliver that I'm going to fix. You know, these 10 people's problems, you know, those 10 people are going to know 10 more people. Yeah. You know, and, and then you end up with, you know, maybe, maybe with this. But if I can end up with three, four, five of these little tiny things that each bring in, you know, a little chunk of money, I'm good. Yeah. You know, so, so I, I, my approach to it at least is don't try to solve the really big problems right out of the gate. Start small. Yeah. You know, start with something tiny, and maybe it grows into a big problem. You know, for all I know, five years from now, I'll be buying Microsoft. <laughs> <laughs> only because uh, it's valuation. Only, only, yeah, I know. No, no, or you're uh, a billionaire. No, only, you know, I mean, five years from now, I might look at this and say, you know, one particular piece of what I'm doing um, ended up being 90% of what you know, where my income comes from. 
you know, but I don't know that now. So by, by spreading things out across a couple different ideas, um, you know, some, some people say it waters you down. You can't focus on any one thing, but I think that you can. I think as, I think as long as you kind of chunk things and, and say, I'm, I'm going to do this, get it to a certain point, and let it go on autopilot, kind of see where it goes before I invest my life savings in it, and I'm going to work on this thing. I'm going I'm to let that one mature and kind of age a little bit and see what it, and then, and if it picks up interest, maybe I jump back to it. So, okay. we'll see. Who has a question? If you do, tell us your name, who you are, and then ask your question. Hello, my name is Janelle Snyder. I'm the founder of Snyder Health. And you spoke very briefly upon your business company. Mm -hmm. So I work with a lot of small businesses, entrepreneurs, and there's kind of two thought processes. One is we're all moving too fast. There's no time for a business plan. It's going to change anyway, so don't bother with it. And the other school of thought is, no, you need to have those long-term goals to keep you from pivoting. Can you give us any more thoughts about that? Um, yeah, I think I kind of struck middle ground. You know, like I said, I put together a three-year plan. Um, the first year is, I wouldn't say it's very detailed, but it's more detailed than the second year. And the third year is kind of, you know, half a dozen bullet points. Here's where I think I want to be. So I kind of staggered it into long-term, where do I want to be? And then for, for year one and year two, how do I get there? So more detail in, in calendar year 2015 than in calendar year 2016. Uh, I have something on my calendar already that around, it's like Thanksgiving week. I'm going to sit down and I'm going to say, okay, now I'm going to plan out more detail for 2016 based on the, the page and a half or so that I've written up already where I think I want to be. I'm going to now detail that one and then I'll do you know, a little more detail for 2017 and a couple of bullet points for 2018. So I, I kind of struck a middle ground of <laughs> I didn't want to try to predict the future because the Lord only knows what's going to happen. So I don't know if that's right or wrong, but it seems to be working for me. Um, if for no other reason, then it, it, it has helped me because I've avoided other shiny objects that I didn't talk about because I could tell right away they weren't, they weren't in that plan. So. Uh, David Jocko, a uh, question. Um, you found something right now that you're getting some traction with. Right. Did you have, have you gone back to having thoughts about what would happen if I spent a little more time and beefed up the way I'm getting content? Because as long as you're building something, you know, maybe if you just put a little bit of fertilizer on it, the thing would explode even more than exploding right now. Um, so you're saying stick with the newsletter? Well, I'm saying generator? I'm saying not stick with it, but as you say, you're dabbling different areas versus walking away completely with it. Well, I'm not, I'm not walking away. I'm just not focusing on it. I'm still using, I sold usage rights, but I still own the code. I still have usage rights. I still actually uh, you know, own, own the, the intellectual property of that application. <laughs> so I'm still generating the newsletter. It's just being delivered through a different channel. Oh, what I'm saying, though, is that you're spending so much time. You came up with, as you described it, a rather um, concise and time efficient way to generate content for the newsletter. Mm -hmm. What I'm saying is, instead of spending only 20 minutes, as you said, maybe spend <laughs> an hour and a half or two hours at this point, see if you can find some additional channels, make the, the newsletter itself a little richer, mm -hmm. and now that you've got a group of people who are already speaking about it, once you make it a little richer, you may find that this, that extra hour or so, instead of giving you a number of seven or eight thousand, now you start getting seventy to eighty thousand and you give it a better chance to become something that is more substantial in terms of your cadre of products. Um, no, I haven't I I, I kinda turn my uh, turn my attention away from it, um, at least for the short term. Um, partially because I want to see where it goes through IT Unity, the company that I, I sold the, the usage rights to and that I'm now uh, using to, to distribute the newsletter. Um, I think that, based on my discussions with them, I think that 7,000 number is, is low. Uh, they have 45,000 people subscribed to their main newsletter right now. Uh, so I expect that, uh, considering I've only been, been using them to advertise the newsletter for not quite two weeks, um, I expect that I'm going to be somewhere in, I'm projecting 20 to 25,000 people by summer. Okay. Um, so I think that it's going to grow a little bit just because of them. 
Um, and if it does, then I can certainly look at increasing the content. I know that's something that they want me to do. Um, I need to see whether I'm going to pursue it. Because uh, remember I said I was happy when I had 23 people the first month. So if I end up with 23,000, um, I'm ecstatic. And I don't make any money directly off of that. So I, I, I'm, I'm not sure where it's going to go. It could be that six months from now I'm back and I'm focusing a lot more on it, or three months from now. Uh, but at least for now, I'm looking at it as it's kind of on autopilot. Okay. So, you know, will that change? Yeah. It, probably. But I don't know in what way. I have a question. Uh, how did you come up with the final deal specs? Was it driven by them? Was it driven by you? Did you Google, how do I sell this company? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's awesome that you still have uh, intellectual property rights. Um, how much flexibility do you have to and what goes on in the future? Two part question. Two part question. Okay, so uh, in some ways, the, the deal specs were I'm, I'm friends with, and actually a former business partner with the guy that runs that company. Um, so he and I just sat down and said, you know, what do you want out of it? What do you want out of it? What do you get? You know, and we, we <coughs> just very casually talked it through. Um, to, to be honest, uh, we haven't signed anything. We, we did the deal on a handshake, which may or may not be interesting. I know, Chris is having a hard time here. Um, but, uh, you know, for whatever it's worth, I trust him, he trusts me. Uh, and maybe that's naive, but. It, it's not like this is the, the billion dollar idea that anybody is going to be retiring off of. Um, so it, it, was, it was, we discussed it. Um, he explained what he was interested in. I actually ended up tweaking the code a little bit um, to support what they needed um, before, selling, you know, before selling them the usage rights. Um, and you know, we, we just kind of talked it through. Is it so, an infinite time frame? Yes. Essentially, what it, what it comes down to is, is they have a copy of the code, I have a copy of the code. We have a, a, a gentleman's agreement between us that if he makes an interesting change to the code, he's going to give it to me. If I make an interesting change, I'll give it to him. So, um, you know, again, that, that is, is almost certainly naive, but because this is not something that I'm looking at and saying, this is my retirement, I'm okay with it. But what if, what if the user base grows so big, Trello says, hey, I want to buy it, it's because of his distribution that it became clear that it would be good to purchase, or right. even on the Microsoft side, was it, his, did he cause the valuation to or go did up? did I cause the valuation? Um, I don't know. Send you through Terry Kerwin boot camp. Yeah, I mean, my, my guess would be at that point, um, you know, I would, I would like to think that, that Dan and I would continue to, you know, treat each other fairly, um, but I don't know. You know, if he ends up turning around and selling it for fifteen million dollars and giving me a hundred bucks, uh, you know what? I'm going to be pissed. Yeah. But <laughs> so why not uh, draft something now that, ah. that has um, some kind of uh, a post up? Yeah, a post up. Uh, <laughs> it's the English major in your view. Right. Yeah. Just the M O U. This is, yeah. say, this is where we sit. Yeah. Say, where we sit. yeah. Especially um, if you do trust it. Because you can't Google hit man anymore. The NSA is looking. All over that. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, but I know people. Yeah. Attention. I know people. You know people. <laughs> um, honestly, I, I, I'd be surprised if it, if it had that kind of legs. You know, could it? Sure. Um, Again, the agreements are only written for the what if happening. Yeah. Right? That's yeah. the purpose of it. That's so. the purpose. Did, did right. Google try to offload its algorithms to Yahoo for like 750,000? And they, everyone was like, nah, I'll make search. Search results we got it, don't yeah. matter. Yeah. Uh, it's good <laughs> enough that we got it. Yeah. Uh, but. All right. Uh, we got room for two questions. I only have one. <laughs> I'm sorry, we can't help you there. Uh, I'm Andrew Schwab. I'm a serial tech entrepreneur. Um, I like what you said about, about the small focus, solving a small problem. I subscribe to that same theory. Mm -hmm. uh, and in my experience, the shiny things come in two categories. One is unrelated, fun, crazy stuff that has absolutely no, no purpose in being on the, uh, on the wall with everything else. And also what we frequently call a scope creep. 
Yeah. Um, so for people who attempt to boil the ocean, so to say. Uh, so what advice would you have for the maybe younger, less experienced entrepreneur who has delusions of grandeur about boiling the ocean? Um, MVP, minimum viable product. Um, toss everything you can think of up on the wall and then look at it and say, what can I absolutely not live without? What, what would, if I went in and talked to somebody about this idea and it didn't have this, they would laugh at me. Everything else is secondary. So that's actually the point where, where Ilya and I, this week, are gonna be kind of working through in our mastermind group, helping me figure out exactly what is the minimum viable product for my internet in a box. What are the things that if I went in front of a client and said, you know, I've got this wonderful thing, and they said, it, it doesn't do this, it doesn't do that, you're wasting my time. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I, I think you have to start at that point, you know, and say, what, what's, the, the, what's the least I can do, the least I can invest, and not be embarrassed to show this to somebody? I guess that's it. Hi, I'm Albert Lazo. I'm the Director of Evaluation Services at Brinker Simpson. And I wanted to dovetail a little bit off of Chris's question and, and discussion. And I was going to ask the same question, is how you got comfort with the value that you got for, for the rights that you sold off. And I think at this point, um, you know, I, I know that I understand that you have a gentleman's agreement, but you're at a point where there is some growth in there. And maybe it might not be a bad idea to at least take a look at, and, and I offer office hours, to take a look at what the revenue stream is and what your projections are going forward. Associated with something comparable that's out there in the marketplace and seeing what that value is because you know you're, maybe it's worth nothing but it also could be worth something five years down the road and to get that in writing I think uh, minimizes your risk when you just have a handshake agreement because you never know what might happen and you know, take advantage of that service that's free right it might be worthwhile for you I think the other part of it too is it's, it's and I think this is probably something that a lot of uh, entrepreneurs struggle with. So if I look at the, the total investment I have in this newsletter generator, mm -hmm. it was nine bucks an hour for somebody, to, for a contractor to spend four to five hours a week gathering content. Uh, the actual newsletter gener generator, I spec'd out in like two hours. I hired somebody on Odesk and built it for $350. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I look at that and say, so my total investment is about 500 bucks. Um, I look at that and say, is it worth any more of my time? You know, at whatever my, I have an internal hourly rate that I say, this is how much I, I charge myself, the essentially. The cost to recreate. Right, so is so. it worth, you know, even another hour of my time mm -hmm. to protect something that cost me 500 bucks? And I don't know, you know, so I mean, I, I may yes. take you up if, if... But it's worthwhile to at least take a look at it and you know, kick the tires and say, here's where we are now, here's where our expectations are mm -hmm. going to be, you know, two years down the road, three years down the road, five years down the road, and, 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 and the assumptions that you would put in, are they reasonable in comparison to what's happening in the marketplace? Determine a market-based risk and say, okay, I'm going to monetize this and say it's worth this much. Mm -hmm. Now, and then you can come up with different scenarios. Well, if we knock it out of the park in year three and year four, it'll be worth this much, maybe. But at least right. have it down. I mean, it's like on, you know, when you watch Shark Tank and they say, "Oh, my idea is worth fifty million dollars." Well, how did they come up with that number? I mean, you can't it's just pull it out. I think they had it dark. Absolutely, it is. Absolutely, a lot of a lot of valuation is, um, you know, more more art than science, but there right. are reasonable assumptions that you can put in to feel comfort with what you're doing. You know, and I think that that, you know, having that um, on a piece of paper, mm -hmm. you know, quantitative piece of paper, you know, that 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 can provide you a lot of comfort. Uh, I may be few off office, office hours. Yeah. I, office I may hours. take that. Yeah. The reason for coming here was to have a, full, a room full of people say, you know, What are you, stupid? <laughs> Why did you do that? <laughs> Tale. Money changes everything. Um, greed is, you know, as old as dirt. And um, if 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 this person and there's no judgment of them, 
uh, really trusts you and um, is grateful to you for your contribution, they'll give you what you deserve. And you have to ensure that that is um, going to be possible. Uh, last good comment, uh, the, the shiny objects thing is uh, it, it's kind of a self-flagellating metaphor for, for entrepreneurs a lot. But you could also have <coughs> divergent thinking, right? So you read one day Nature Magazine and then New York Times and then the Economist, like that could be uh, seen as ADD, but it also gives you a unique perspective. Do you think bouncing around, like, help to get to a unique thing to say, you know, who would put this linkage together and build this? Is it actually the, the value of, of your mind manifest or is it an obstacle or both? That's a really complicated question. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to kind of interpret it as I've always taken the approach. I've, I've uh, my I work from home, um, all you know, full time, and uh, I have an office that I have a whiteboard, and, and there's no idea that's too stupid to go on the whiteboard. It may only last 15 minutes, but if I think of something, I write it down, and then usually I, I leave it there because I mull it over. It's just kind of there in the background, um, and who knows where it's going to go. So, and, and not all of the ideas that go up there are software products or technology related or, or anything like that. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think that no idea is too stupid to at least go on the board. Um, whether it goes anywhere from there, I don't know. Like I said, I go, and I know I'm blowing my 30 second time limit, but I'm good at that. Um, you know, forcing to, to move away from the shiny object that I was, was headed down the road with, with this visual CMS thing. Um, forcing me to basically look at all the ideas on my board and, and start to segment them out uh, to figure out what had what I thought had legs um, is what made me realize you know I've got a whole chunk of things here that could roll under one umbrella that is in my wheelhouse that I do have traction in that I know is a problem and I know people will pay for it. so in that sense having you know stupid little ideas that you know, make the, the newsletter generator at 500 bucks look like a massive investment. Um, combine them with a bunch of other things, and yeah, then there's value. You know, so I, I think that okay, diversion thinking, whatever it may be, I just I just like to write down anything I think of that is you know, even for 30 seconds is mildly interesting because who knows where it's going to go. All right, amen for that. Thank you.